This is another tutorial on fundamentals, aimed at helping you to understand more complex concepts later on. I'm going to be explaining what photons are and how photon beams interact with matter, which is how they deposit dose. I'll also be explaining how the energy of a beam and the material through which it's passing affect its behaviour, which is useful for understanding why X-ray equipment is designed the way it is and why dose distributions look the way they do inside patients. Photons are particles of light, or in more physics terms, of electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation exists as a spectrum which contains many different kinds of radiation that divided up according to their energy. At opposite ends of the spectrum we have radio waves and high energy photons like gamma rays and x-rays. Radio waves are down the low energy end of the spectrum, and gamma rays and x-rays are up the high energy end. Visible light, the part we can see, is somewhere near the middle, with red being of lower energy than blue. When the spectrum is drawn, gamma rays are normally shown as having a higher energy than x-rays. The only real difference between the two is that gamma rays are emitted from atomic nuclei during radioactive decay, and x-rays are produced by electrons as they lose energy. Putting gamma rays as higher on the energy scale is more historically driven than accurate. Since early x-ray equipment actually did produce significantly lower energy x-rays, but with the advent of high energy particle accelerators such as medical linear accelerators, this is no longer true. Photons are little particles of electromagnetic radiation. They are basically all energy, have no mass, and move at the speed of light. The classification of photons, so whether they're radio waves, visible light, or high energy photons like x-rays and gamma rays, depends not just on their energy but also upon their behaviour. Radio waves pass through things, visible light bounces off things, and high energy photons pass through things but also cause damage on the way through. This damage occurs via ionisation, so it's a property of photons with a high enough energy to knock electrons off atoms. Lower energy varieties of radiation, like microwaves and visible light, can also cause damage, but this is via heating and not ionisation. So you don't have to worry about getting cancer from your mobile phone or from standing too close to your microwave. Ultraviolet radiation does have enough energy to cause ionization, which is why it causes sunburn, but for some reason it's not classified as ionizing radiation. The standard unit of energy is the joule, but the actual unit used for a specific application depends upon the amount of energy that's usually involved. 8,700 kilojoules is a figure you'll be used to seeing on a McDonald's menu. It's the amount of chemical energy required to power a human body for a day. We we'll use kilojoules here because the amount of energy involved is quite high so it makes sense to use a larger unit. But the energy involved in radiation interactions is much, much smaller. So when we look at things on this scale, we use a much smaller unit. The one that we favor in radiotherapy is the electron volt, or EV for short. One electron volt is equal to 1.6 and a bit times 10 to the negative 19 joules. The reason that it's such a messy number rather than a straight multiple of a joule is that it's the amount of kinetic energy that will be gained by an electron if it was accelerated using an electrical field of one volt. This unit is way, way smaller than the joule, to give you an idea of the difference in scale between the energy contained within what you ate for lunch and the energies involved in radiotherapy, if you convert your recommended daily food energy intake into electron volts, you get a figure of 54 million million billion electron volts, which is a massive number. Depending on the source, eating this amount of energy is a good idea, but absorbing it via radiation exposure will definitely kill you. If an average 70 kilogram human being absorbed this amount of radiation energy, it will be roughly equivalent to a dose of 120,000 gray. The amount of energy that we like to give in order to kill tumors in radiotherapy is in the order of tens of gray, say for example 60 to 70, and a whole body dose of 5 gray can be lethal without medical treatment. Radiotherapy kills tumors via ionization damage, by knocking electrons off atoms contained within. In a radiotherapy photon beam, the photons themselves are only directly responsible for one out of every 200,000 ionizations. The rest of the ionization, and therefore the damage, is caused by electrons which are released via interaction with photons, known as secondary electrons. As such, photons are basically a vehicle for carrying energy deep inside tissues where it can be transferred to electrons. This allows electrons to be released and to cause damage at depths much greater than they would be able to reach on their own. Because photon beams produce most of their damage via the action of secondary electrons, they're known as a form of indirectly ionizing radiation. Neutrons are another example of indirectly ionizing radiation, as they can interact with nuclei and produce secondary protons. Beams of electrons and neutrons are also often used in radiotherapy. They cause most of their ionization and damage directly, so therefore they're known as forms of directly ionizing radiation. There are only a certain number of ways that the X-rays and gamma rays used in radiotherapy can interact with matter and cause ionization. Basically, they're all variations on the theme of smacking into things. Photons colliding and causing the release of energetic particles, like secondary electrons, which pass through matter and cause further ionization. There are a number of different ways that photons can do this. We have no way of predicting which method an individual photon will use, so the selection of the process is actually quite random. But we can get an idea of which processes are likely based on the energy of the photon and the material through which it's passing, in particular its atomic number. The first interaction type that we're going to talk about is called coherent scattering, with coherent basically meaning that there's no energy transfer in the collision, which is a usage that pops up fairly frequently in medical physics. It's also known as Rayleigh scattering, after the man who discovered it. 
Essentially what happens is that a photon comes in, interacts with the electron surrounding an atom, and is deflected without any change in energy. I've included this here for the sake of completeness and because it might pop up on an exam. It is not discussed frequently in radiotherapy because it involves no energy transfer and therefore no deposition of dose. It's also relatively rare in radiotherapy beams because it occurs most often when the beam energy is low and the atomic number of the material that it's passing through is high. The beams that we use in radiotherapy tend to be quite high energy and patient tissues tend to have a fairly low atomic number. The photoelectric effect gets a lot of love in the physics community because explaining how it works helped to prove the existence of the photon. The way it works is that a photon comes in and strikes an electron that's bound to an atom. The photon is absorbed completely by the electron and becomes the electron's kinetic energy, or energy of motion, which allows it to escape from its atomic orbital and fly off into the surrounding medium as a secondary electron. The initial collision causes one ionization by freeing the electron from its atomic bonds. The secondary electron causes more as it travels away from its origin. In the example that I've just drawn, the photoelectric effect frees an inner shell electron which leaves a vacancy. As I mentioned before, electrons prefer to occupy orbitals that are closer to the nucleus, so an outer orbital electron will drop down to fill this gap. Because the outer orbital electron has a higher energy than is required to occupy the inner orbital, it must shed some energy as it changes orbital, which it does in the form of a photon. This is an example of characteristic X-ray emission. It can also give its excess energy to another electron within the atom, causing it to be released as well. This is an example of the Auger effect. A photon is most likely to undergo the photoelectric effect when its energy is relatively low, but still higher than the binding energy of the electron it strikes, because if the energy is lower than this, it can't free the electron from its orbital, and the photoelectric effect can't take place. So it's most likely when the photon energy is within the order of killer electron volts. It's also more likely when the photon is traveling through a material with a high atomic number. Compton, or incoherent scattering, implying that there's energy loss in the process, is named after its discoverer, Arthur Holly Compton. It's somewhat similar to the photoelectric effect in that a photon comes in and strikes an electron, but this time the photon is not completely absorbed, it only transfers a portion of its energy to the electron. The photon bounces off in a different direction with a slightly lower energy. The difference is donated to the electron as kinetic energy, which causes it to go shooting off as a secondary electron. The physics textbooks will often tell you that this interaction occurs only between a photon and a free electron, implying that the electron is not bound to an atom. This isn't necessarily true, it just means that the energy of the photon is much, much higher than the binding energy of the electron, so the binding energy is considered to be negligible, therefore the electron can be seen to be free. This interaction tends to occur more often at higher photon energies than the photoelectric effect. In fact, it's the most common type of interaction in radiotherapy photon beams when passing through a normal human body. The probability of interaction doesn't depend much on the atomic number of the materials through which the photons are passing, but it does increase with the electron density of the material. Which makes sense, because if you pack more electrons into a given volume, there are more targets for the photons to hit, therefore the interactions are more likely. While it's usually the most common interaction type in radiotherapy beams, the probability does decrease slightly with beam energy, becoming equally as likely as a pair production effect with energies of around about 24 MeV. At fairly high energies, above 1.022 mega electron volts, photons can start to undergo pair production. This one doesn't actually involve photons knocking electrons off atoms, so it doesn't cause ionization directly, but it does produce secondary particles that do. During pair production, a photon comes in and interacts with the magnetic field of an atomic nucleus. Its energy is converted into an electron-positron pair. Part of the photon's energy is used to create the mass of the electron-positron pair, and the remainder is divided up amongst the two particles as kinetic energy. There are two particles created in this process. That's why it's called pair production. A photon can also interact with the electromagnetic field of an electron. This results in the creation of an electron-positron pair, which goes shooting away from the interaction site, and it imparts kinetic energy to the electron that was hit by the photon, sending it shooting away from the interaction site itself. This results in three particles emerging from the interaction, so this is called triplet production, which is much more rare than pair production. So how do you get electrons and positrons which have mass from a photon which has none? Remember E equals mc squared, the relationship between mass and energy. According to this relationship, you can trade a lot of energy for a little bit of mass. That's essentially what's happening here. That's why there's a minimum energy of 1.022 MeV. This is the amount of energy that you need to create the masses of an electron and a positron, which have a mass energy of 0.511 MeV each. Remember the laws of conservation of mass and energy. Like anything else, the particles involved in pair production obey these. The energy of the photon is converted into the mass of the electron-positron pair, and anything left over is divided up between the two resulting particles as kinetic energy. There's also a law of conservation of charge. It's obeyed here because the electron and positron have equal and opposite charges, which cancel out and add to zero, so that matches the initial charge of the photon, which is also zero. The reason that a photon can only undergo pair production next to a nucleus or an electron is that there's also a law of conservation of momentum. This law is the reason why something can't just suddenly stop or start moving without hitting something. In this case it means that the photon isn't able to give all of its momentum to the electron-positron pair, so it has to happen next to an object with mass so it can donate the rest of its momentum to this object. A photon is most likely to undergo the pair production process when its energy is high. The process requires a minimum energy of 1.022 MeV 
because photons less than this energy don't have enough energy to create the mass of the positron electron pair. Above this energy, the interaction becomes steadily more and more likely as the energy increases. It's also more likely when the photon is passing through a high atomic number material. A positron is a positive electron. The two have the same mass but an opposite charge. A positron is also the antiparticle of an electron. What that means is that when the two combine, they go through something similar to a reversal of the pair production process, in that the electron and positron both convert their energy into mass in the form of photons, except there's one key difference. In pair production, one photon comes in and an electron-positron pair comes out. When the process is reversed, which is known as positron annihilation, an electron-positron pair goes in and two photons come out. There are two photons because of the law of conservation of momentum. Electrons and positrons tend to annihilate when both particles are pretty much at rest, so their momentum is essentially zero. When this happens, the two photons are emitted in exactly opposite directions. Because the photons are emitted in opposite directions, their momentum cancels out and adds to zero, which matches the zero momentum of the electron-positron pair at the beginning of the interaction, so momentum is conserved. Both photons will also have an energy of 0.511 MeV, which is equivalent to both the electron and positron mass energy. So the mass of the electron-positron pair is converted into energy and shared equally between the two resulting photons. If the electron-positron pair are still moving when they annihilate, they will have some residual kinetic energy, which will be shared between the two photons. They'll also still have some momentum, so the two photons will be emitted at a slight forward angle. The fact that positron annihilation photons are generally emitted in exactly opposite directions is a basis for pet energy, which stands for positron emission tomography. The basic process involves using the detection of annihilation photons in order to locate radioactive material within a patient. A PET scanner is basically a ring of radiation detectors. When a positron annihilation occurs inside the ring, it will emit photons in exactly opposite directions. When two photons are simultaneously detected by the ring, we're able to determine that a positron annihilation has taken place somewhere along the line connecting the two. This allows us to determine the approximate location of positron emitting radioisotopes within the body. Photonuclear interaction is the highest energy photon interaction type that we care about in radiotherapy. As the name implies, it's an interaction between a photon and an atomic nucleus. It happens when a high-energy photon strikes a nucleus and causes it to break apart, emitting nuclear particles like protons and neutrons, which is why we only see this interaction type happening in very high-energy photon beams, become significant at beam energies of 10 MV and above. But even in high-energy beams, this interaction is relatively rare, so it doesn't contribute very much to patient dose. The main reason that this is of interest is as a consideration in radiation protection. This is because it can produce neutrons, which can quite happily bounce around inside and through high atomic number materials like lead, which are typically used to shield against low-energy X-ray beams. This is why we use concrete to shield against high-energy photon beams instead, since it contains a lot of low atomic number materials, which are much better at absorbing neutrons. The likelihood of occurrence of different photon interaction types that we've talked about on previous slides depends upon the photon energy, the material atomic number, and sometimes the electron density as well. The photoelectric effect tends to be the most common interaction type in high atomic number materials and when the photon energy is low, but still higher than electron binding energies within the material. The probability of this interaction occurring drops as the atomic number drops and the photon energy rises. The pair production effect is most likely when both the material atomic number and the photon energy are high, down to the lower threshold of 1.022 MeV, below which the interaction probability becomes zero because the photon doesn't have enough energy to generate an electron-positron pair. The Compton interaction is the most common within the range of clinically utilized beam energies. It has a low probability of very, very low energies, and after reaching a peak, it tends to drop off slowly with energy.